Hi, welcome to my latest edition of All Things Aviation and Aerospace. I'm Vince Mickens. For those of you who follow and watch and listen to my show, there are a couple of things that you probably already know. You know that I make it a, my mission to inspire aspiring young aviation and aerospace professionals. You know that I present a wide variety of opportunities and inspiring possibilities in our industry. And you know that I crack the corniest of jokes on the planet. Well, today will be no different except for the joke part. Maybe not, but particularly on the subject matter. Today is another show about aviation STEM, but with a unique twist. I am talking about Tango Flight. I first learned about Tango Flight a couple of years ago while I was at the Airbus Pavilion at EAA Air Venture and saw this kit plane called an RV-12 parked behind the Airbus Pavilion. Now, there are literally thousands of airplanes at Air Venture, so it didn't necessarily jump out at me, other than I was wondering why it was parked behind the Airbus, Airbus Pavilion, and that it was built by high school students is what really got my attention. Uh, so I, of course, took a closer look and started asking a lot of questions. And that's when I met John O'Leary, the vice president for engineering programs at Airbus Americas, who started telling me about Tango Flight. And so today, that's what we're here to talk about. We're going to talk about Tango Flight and its origin, its programs. We also have a former high school student who participated in the program and was inspired by the program. Uh, and, you know, where she is now. We'll tell you all about that in a little bit. But I'm going to start out with the founder of Tango Flight. So let me introduce Dan Wyant. Dan, as I always do, I always forget to double check and make sure I pronounced your name correctly. Is Wyant correct? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. So I could have gotten away with that and not let everybody know that I wasn't sure. Yep. And there's other people that watch this show that goes, there he goes again. But anyhow. Dan is a computer science major who initially was a software consultant in the private sector after graduating from North Carolina State University. But he eventually left the private sector and headed up engineering programs for a public school system in Central Texas. Then came Tango Flight. Obviously, we have a lot to tell. There's a whole lot more to tell about that. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Next is my friend, John O'Leary. As I mentioned, well, as I didn't mention, but John was a Navy guy like me, so nothing else needs to be said. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, John is the Vice President of Engineering Programs for Airbus Americas. He's a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. He served in the United States Marine Corps, as well as the Naval Reserve. Earlier in his career, he was a project engineer and program manager for Hawker Beechcraft favorite aircraft of mine. So, uh, John, you could do no wrong in my book. But most importantly for my show, John is dedicated to seeing more young people be introduced to aviation STEM. And then meeting him for the first time, I also have with us David Day. David is the Prior High School, located just out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Innovation Center Director. This center is a STEM dream with applied engineering, um, robotics, sorry about that, uh, CAD, or what's known as computer-aided design, computer science, EMT, which stands for emergency medical technicians, eSports, which is all about gaming, and of course, aviation programs. Prior to his current role, David taught physical science and was a basketball coach for 24 years. Just found out that his daughter plays golf, so he's kind of shifted gears in, in that regard so he can hang out with her, which is really cool. Uh, David holds a Bachelor of Science degree from Oklahoma State University and a Master's from East Central University in Educational Leadership. David, as I mentioned to you earlier, I was raised by educators, and so I, I welcome you to the show. Thank and you. speaking of school, we have Emily Moore. Emily is a former <laughs> high school student and, and a beneficiary, if I can say that, of, Tangle, of the Tangle Flight program. It really inspired her with regard to aviation. And now she's a certified 
airframe and power plant technician. Uh, and she has quite the story to tell. So we're, we're really looking forward to that. Emily is also planning on attending Stephen F. Austin State University this fall to study environmental science and uh, with a minor in biology. She hopes to work for NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and or, and I put it that way, and or NASA one day. So I think that's that's a great aspiration and, and um, really looking forward to that. Hey guys, uh, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Okay, you can't get quiet on me now that we're live. <laughs> <laughs> we were doing all this talking and everything and, and now we're live and you guys are like, hi. Um, <laughs> so I'll start with you though, Dan. You know, I, I think it's really neat uh, what I learned about Tangle Flight and what I've observed about it. Uh, you guys were again at the uh, at Oshkosh, as was I, uh, and this time uh, instead of being on the on the ramp behind uh, Airbus Americas, you guys were actually at Aero Educate, which is quite appropriate for, for what you do. But tell us about your inspiration for this program and, and how Tangle Flight came about. Uh, sure. So, well, like you mentioned. Um... I've moved from the private sector sector into education when my daughter was young. I wanted to have a similar schedule as her and kind of fell into starting engineering programs in high schools around Central Texas. And from there, I got my pilot's license, bought an airplane, decided to build an airplane. Um, my wife tend, says I tend to overdo things, so um, she's probably right. And uh, then said, you know, it'd be really a neat idea to build an airplane with my high school students. And that's really where Tango Flight came from. I went to the school superintendent, he said no. I went back and forth with him for a long time and finally he gave me permission to start Tango Flight. So that was fall of 2016, we started that. We get a few months into it, uh, somebody does a little article on us. I get a call from some guy in Wichita, Kansas that says, hey, we'd like to do a program up here. And that of course was John. And um, the great thing about that is it made me think about national level from the ver almost the very beginning versus just local state level. So we started our first um, expansion program fall of 2017 in Wichita, and um, we've uh, been going strong since then. We'll, we'll yeah. be in uh, 30 high schools in 13 states this fall. Yeah, so I'm gonna go back for something though. So it sounds like you started in aviation a little later in life. It wasn't something that you did early. Am I right about that? Yeah, I always was interested in aviation. You know, my my goal in high school was to be a pilot and you know astronaut and you know all that stuff. I actually started out college in aerospace engineering and found out a couple things. Um, I didn't like calculus, and I'm not real oh. bright. So I switched to software engineering, which had more calculus, but they hit it better. But um, also <laughs> at that time, jobs in aerospace were few and far between. So it was a good choice career-wise, and uh, but always had that interest in aviation. My grandfather had a J3 Cub when he was young. And so, you know, I remember him talking about that growing up. Uh, so finally, later on in life, I was able to afford to get my private pilot's license and you know, kind of figured out a way to tie it back into my career now. Yeah, so I, I brought that up because, you know, I think what happens to a lot of us is that we, we have a path that we think we're going to take and we end up taking it a different way. So you, you were exposed to aviation earlier. You had interest in it in high school, but it, it, it took a while before you, and, and then you even redirected yourself when you were thinking aerospace engineering, you ended up with computer science. And, you know, as, we, as, we, as we've heard, Here's the rest of the story in terms of Tango Flight and everything. So I, I like to place the, an exclamation point on that for our audience to understand that, you know, your path is not always going to be what you think it is. But if your passion and interest in, in the case of everybody that we've talked to is aviation, you know, here, here are examples of the way that happens. You know, I thought it was also interesting, too, and I'd forgotten about this, that uh, um, John actually was one of the initial people that was interested in Tango Flight. John, how did that come about? How did you, you know, find out about it and decide you wanted to uh, you know, get involved? Yeah, an interesting conversation. We we had been thinking about our presence here in Wichita, Kansas, and the fact that Airbus came to Wichita, Kansas to gain access to engineering talent. 
just had quite a bit of that here in the area. And there was already a relationship with Hawker Beechcraft uh, and what was called the Hawker. Um, so it was uh, an easy move, but it also said we need to maintain an aviation environment. We need to maintain a strong ecosystem of aviation here in the Wichita area in order to continue to have uh, have young people coming into the into the into the industry. We happened to be up at AirVenture, uh, and at the time, my the chief executive for Airbus Americas, a gentleman by the name of Barry Eccleson, wonderful aerospace professional in his own right. I mean, very very accomplished, but also like many of us, kind of an airplane nut. Barry would probably smile if you heard me say that. He happened. He looked at me and said, "He, uh, why aren't we building one of these RV12s? Because there was a number of RV12 build programs there." And I said, "Yeah, I, I don't know." Uh, and so the boss said, "Go get it done." And uh, and happened to bump into Dan, and then that, from there it became, "We gotta we gotta hurry up and get something going because uh, I've got a I've got a task." Right. The, what's man. really <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, I I can read an org chart and I know what my boss told me to go do. Um, you know, but the airplane build itself, um, is really turns out to be just a way to have a conversation with, uh, with young folks in high school at the ninth, you know, 10th, 11th and 12th grade level. We've seen all kinds of young folks come through the program and it's really turned into more of the business of aviation. What is it that you're interested in life? And you can probably do that in aviation is what we're finding. So the, the airplane is just a cool way to have a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so and one of the things that I like about this program is that it places a lot of emphasis on the STEM side, the aviation STEM side regarding, uh, you know, being a technician, a mechanic and things like that. You know, we all kind of take for granted that a pilot track is, is a given uh, in terms of aviation. Uh, but we don't always, you know, necessarily look at the other aspects of it and and then you just brought up a really great point that I hadn't really given a whole lot of thought to until just now. And that is, is that a program like this can prepare you for a lot of different aspects of the industry. Uh, I think Emily is going to give us a very good example of that in terms of her interests and, and what she's done so far. And she's been on both sides of it with, with getting a couple of uh, ratings as a pilot, but also um, being a certified uh, AMP and currently working in that capacity as she gets ready to go to school, et cetera. So it's going to be fun, Emily, to to <laughs> talk about that with you. And since I brought you up, I'm going to go ahead and start there and, and ask <laughs> okay. you. So tell us how you got interested in aviation and 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 how you got inspired by Tango Flight. Yeah. So. Um... Nobody in my family was an aviator. I didn't know anything about it, but I've always wanted to fly. I didn't care how I did it. I just wanted to fly. So when I saw aerospace engineering on my little elective for high school, I thought, heck yeah, I'm going to join that. So I did. I didn't really know what to expect. But when they told me I was going to build an airplane, I was like, you're joking, right? Turns out they weren't joking. <laughs> um, <laughs> And that, so, that really grabbed you, huh? Yeah. Um, so let's see. So I really enjoyed learning. There was so much learning to be done. We learned in the classroom. We learned um, how to build an aircraft. And we even went out to the airport every couple of weeks. Um, and that is what I really fell in love with because it wasn't your traditional sit in a classroom kind of class, you got to go outside and experience stuff. Um, and we would go to this little flight school called Pilot Choice Aviation, and we would get to help the mechanics um, just do a little maintenance stuff like open inspection panels, oil changes and stuff like that. But I really, I fell in love with it. Um, I really did. You found, kind of found your calling. But I also find it kind of interesting that you um, decided you wanted to also get your pilot's license. So yeah. what in, what made you do that? Well, I talked to Mr. Wyatt and I asked him if I should get an A&P or a pilot's license. And he said, why not get both? So <laughs> out Great I went. Advice. Great advice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there was this guy uh, who was front desk worker. His name was Elliam Henderson. And he I was working one day and he said, Hey, you want to go on a flight? I said, I can do that. Uh, yeah, sure. 
So we went out, we went to go get barbecue. He let me fly around a little bit and it was really cool. And when we landed, he said, hey, why, why aren't you flying? We're at a flight school, you work here. You know, you get a discount, why aren't you flying? And I asked myself the same question. I was like, I'm, I'm only 17, 18. I didn't know I could do that. Um, so that kind of got the ball, ro- ball rolling for me. And I had the support of all the mechanics and everybody there. And they uh, kind of encouraged me to go do that and take my flight lessons. And, and I so really- now you have your private, you have your instrument, uh, and you're continuing on with that. I, I would think um, knowing both sides of it in terms of how to fix a plane, but then also yeah. how to fly it has to have some advantages and some real pluses for you. Yeah, um, it's really, really neat because um, uh, anything that could possibly go wrong, um, not that anything would go wrong, but you know, if something like the electrical system failed, you would know kind of what's going on the ins and outs of what to do with that kind of right um emergency situations you know what to do you can pick the airplane apart um I just I didn't want to go fly not knowing the ins and outs of what I'm really flying yeah so you know you were talking about you guys went to get barbecue ribs we used to call it the hundred dollar hamburger I call it <laughs> yeah, the, the two hundred dollar hamburger now and I guess it's a two hundred dollar you know, rack of ribs, but anyhow, yeah. um, um, you know, this is a perfect segue for me though, seriously, to, to talk with uh, David. David, you're, uh, you actually head up a program. You're a director of the innovation center there at, at Prior High School that has Tango Flight along with a lot of other really great things. So uh, I wanted to, we definitely want to talk about Tango Flight, but just kind of give us an overview of that program and also how Tango Flight became uh, involved with you guys. So we are on Rogers State University campus within the Mid America Industrial Park. Okay. So our we are a sat, basically a satellite piece of our high school. So all the tech stuff kind of comes out here, and as you said, we have the CAD robotics. Uh, EMT, computer science, and the aviation falls under me as well, and and, and, and esports, um, and applied engineering. So um, we have all those courses here. Um, we have been doing the AOPA. We've used the AOPA curriculum, and this is our going to be our sixth year, I think, to use the AOPA curriculum in our program. You know, it starts off small because kids really don't know what it is, but it's really grown. We're at fifty, I think, fifty students enrolled right now nine through 12 in our high school, which is a pretty good chunk of ours. Uh, currently in Oklahoma, I think there's like 84 schools that use the AOPA curriculum. And yeah, that's, a, that's a really great program. Yeah. It's great how Tangle Flight kind of complements that. With, with well, Tangle. and that's something we saw. So we didn't like, and this is kind of, we didn't really like the, I hate to say this negatively, but we didn't like the senior year level of doing a research project because the kids have been doing hands-on and they've been doing using our flight simulators and they've been doing all that thing. So we thought, you know, we need something else. And we were driving to Ada, Oklahoma, because they were the first school to use the AOPA. And my I have a private pilot that's one of our teachers as well. And we were driving down there to go check out their program just to get some ideas. And he he said, hey, what do you think about this? And it was Tango Flight. So I was like, I don't know, let's look at it. So I get on the phone and let's make a phone call. And I call Craig, I think, and talk to Craig about it. And, you know, one thing led to another and here we are. And even an interesting story, we were going to go, Jim, that's my pilot. We were going to fly down to Durant and go look at Southeastern University's program. And then we were going to go to Austin all in one day and go visit Dan and Craig down there. And he, Jim calls me at Man, he calls me at like 1130 at night and says, Dave, we're not going. And I'm like, what? And he goes, we're not going. He goes, I'm up in the air. I was doing a check ride to make sure everything was good. He goes, my gear won't come down. And so he had to actually crash land at Tulsa or belly land at Tulsa International that evening. So we called and said we can't make it. But it all worked out well. These guys have been great. I tell you, they, uh, you know, anytime I pick up the phone and call, they they call and they even take me out to dinner when they come visit. So that's even good. So, uh, you know. Yeah. And they give you a really nice looking golf shirt that I don't have. But there yeah. you go. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. Just not to get any hints. I've never been, I've never to, been to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> but, you know, um, uh, Dan, the program 
we, you and I were having a conversation recently about it. And one of the things about the Tangle Flight program is that it's the way you put it into a school. Can you tell us a little bit more how you uh, do that, engage the school with the curriculum and, and, and the, the, the method you use to entice them to give them a little sample of what it's going to be all about for the kids? So, so sure. So I believe we're unique in that we're not an airplane build program. We are a STEM high school program. Um, we have dual credit agreements with a number of universities around the country um, that is a STEM curriculum. It has a classroom piece. We have a full two-year academic curriculum. And then we have the lab, and the lab just happens to be building an airplane. Um, and for folks in education, it's always, of course, always about the educational value. Yeah, you know, administrators should care less about building airplanes other than it's a cool gee whiz thing. But at the end of the day, they need to check their boxes and make sure the kids are learning something useful. So we do that. And then I think the most brilliant part of this, and I'll take credit for it, although Craig would quickly point out it was dumb luck on my part, is the mentor side of it. Um, with our very first school, I literally called everybody I knew that could spell airplane and conned them to come on up to the school to help uh, with this build and it worked great. Then our first expansion was Wichita, where John provided the mentors from his employees, and that worked great. Then when we expanded somewhere else, I really wondered, would I be able to find mentors? Uh, I think that's been the best story about this. Everywhere we have programs, we've had people literally come out of the woodwork and show up for this men uh, to be mentors. And the fact that these adults with aviation experience, a lot of times they're retirees, with just tremendous amount of experience. I can spend hours telling you stories about some of the relationships that have developed between the student and the mentor. And, you know, that's helped them with career advice, just general direction, and just sitting there talking to them. I really think that is probably the most significant portion of this program right there. You know, I, I, I'm so glad that you talk about that and, and the mentorship, because I, I tell young people all of the time, that we love talking about our industry. And so you can walk up to anybody that works in any aspect of this industry and, and start a conversation and we're not going to let you go. We, in fact, you, we're going to tell you a lot more than you probably might have wanted to hear <laughs> in a moment. But, and, and Emily, you're laughing because you know it's true, right? I know. <laughs> I've seen it all. I've heard it all. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, we're proud of the industry and, and, and our industry is a community. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very special one because it's kind of unique because there's so many, and I love to bring this point up whenever I can, there's so many different aspects of it. So um, even in, in certain niches, so, you know, you can talk about being a pilot, different kind of pilots, you can talk about being a mechanic or a technician, and, and there's so many different aspects of that, and I could go on and on. So, um, and by the way, Emily, I, I had a guest on my show about a year and a half ago who mm -hmm. got her AMP but was also interested in, you know, space, aerospace and space exploration. So after completing a two-year program and getting her AMP cert certification, she got picked up by SpaceX. So oh she's a gosh. mechanic at SpaceX. You know? wow. so, who knew yeah, that's awesome. that SpaceX also needs mechanics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's just one really good example of, of something like that. Uh, so I have a habit of sometimes getting derailed. So let me get back on track. Uh, John, let me go back to you and, and talk a little bit about uh, Airbus's commitment to this type of program and interest in it and what it is. You know, tell us about the experience in Kansas and then just overall what it is that why Airbus is so committed to doing something like this or being involved. Yeah, um, I touched a little bit on some of the pipeline questions and challenges and saying you got to have a, a, a viable aviation ecosystem in order to keep the Keep people interested in aviation, continue to get gather, gather up talent and, <clears throat> and deliver the programs that we have. So here in the in the Wichita area, we're, we are an engineering center. So our main focus is around engineering. <clears throat> in Mobile, Alabama, we also have a number of programs. I know you you met with uh, Michelle uh, and the FlightWorks Alabama program down there where we got a final assembly line. And there we really think about the entire aspect of everything from OEM activities, you know, uh, company, airframe companies, if you will, the original equipment manufacturer. So getting people into a production environment, going straight through uh, high school into flight path nine and 
internships into the uh, into the programs in order to make the transition from uh, I know nothing about airplanes to now I'm going to build an airliner. So helping helping uh, young folks do that transition, as well as having paths from which once people get on board the company, we can then develop them and, and grow them through the company into different skills and, and across the board. So it really comes down to, uh, in the nicest possible way, just self-preservation within the industry. You comment on the fact that we are a small industry. Uh, it is a community. Uh, it's hard to find somebody in the industry we don't already know. And so bringing in more capability into the industry, more aspects into the industry and really and growing it is, uh, is critical to the health of the industry. Yeah. Dan, tell us about that, um, the flight works, your involvement with that, uh, that, that John was just speaking of that took place down at, in, uh, in Alabama. Um, well, we had a, I'm talking about with uh, the Delta trip or? Yeah, with the Delta trip. Okay. So, yeah. So, um, oh gosh, back in April this year, we took and flew, I believe it was 27 students from my school at um, uh, Carver Steam Academy and in downtown Atlanta, we flew all the kids, uh, teachers, and a few parents, and a bunch of Delta folks and a bunch of Airbus folks from uh, Atlanta down to Mobile for the day. Uh, picked them up at the airport, uh, took them out to Flightworks, uh, Flightworks, gave them a tour there, then did the tour of the Airbus final assembly line. Uh, the vast majority of these kids had never been on an airplane before in their life, so it was uh, quite a quite a fun experience. I opened the experience. It, it was. Uh, the Delta guys did a great job. They um, you know, greeted them at the airport, escort, helped them get through security, you know, things that we kind of take for granted, but they really had no idea what they needed to do there to make sure they were comfortable with that and made it a really great experience for them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I saw the, the uh, reviews about that and uh, the, the write-up, I should say, about it and saw that, you know, there was a, a Delta captain that was involved in terms of yeah. interacting with the kids and things like that. So it just sounds overall like it was like it was a really really great uh, program um, and a really great opportunity. You know, speaking of the schools, so you got you mentioned earlier you guys were in thirteen states, um, and I told you I was going <laughs> to put you on the spot and ask you, but I really would like our audience to know what states you're currently in, and then if you want to point out anything in particular besides you know we just talked about prior high school, but if you want to talk about any of the other programs that kind of stand out or whatever, uh, feel free to do that. Sure. So um, obviously we're in Texas. That's our biggest state for a number of reasons. That's where we started. Um, our first school, our first state we expanded into was Kansas. Uh, we have two schools in the Wichita area. And then um, along that corridor, we have Oklahoma. We have four Oklahoma schools already have signed one for next fall with a couple more that I think will come on board. Um, we have two in Alabama and just yesterday signed a third one that'll be starting next fall for Alabama. Um, we have one in Georgia, the Atlanta program, uh, one in Nebraska, uh, two in Tennessee and talking with a couple more for potential fall of 24 starts in, uh, in Tennessee, Eastern Tennessee, which is kind of nice because that's where I'm at. So that makes my travel schedule a little bit easier. Uh, one in Connecticut. Uh, one in California, one in Virginia, talking with a couple more uh, groups in Virginia. We've got a company, uh, Next Gen Aviation, that uh, we partner with that's helped us uh, recruit a couple schools up in their next, neck of the woods. And then let's see, two brand new ones. I'm actually leaving Sunday to go over to North Carolina to do training at our two new North Carolina schools. Uh, one is in Kitty Hawk, which is uh, it is first flight high school. So I'm kind of excited about that one. Uh, uh, that sounds actually, pretty neat, actually. Yeah, they actually got permission. I'm not sure how um, how they pulled this off. Um, Shannon, the CTE director there, uh, she somehow got permission from a uh, federal park service to do the build at the monument or well, at the airport, which is walking distance from the high school. It's so close. So that that's going to be an exciting location and then Winston-Salem, and oh, and then my favorite location, just because it's such a pain in the rear to get to, is Wasilla, Alaska, um, so that gives us 13 states. You guys are up in Alaska, really? Yeah, I, I'm not real good at geography, obviously. I must have skipped that day of school, so um, it, 
it's it's been amazing to see how we grow. We do very little advertising. Um, almost all of our schools have been word of mouth. And so when someone reaches out to us and is excited about this, it's very difficult to tell them no, even if they aren't necessarily in the greatest location. Um, I was talking with a group in Guam, probably just as well that hasn't gone anywhere yet, but um, you know, it's, it's very hard to tell someone no when they get excited about doing this. And what's wrong an RV 12 can't get to Guam. I mean, what's going on? <laughs> well, you can get anything anywhere if you try hard enough. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, so I was going to ask you two things. One, one, I was going to ask you when you travel, are you currently flying an RV 12? Um, no, we, we have a slight problem in that we don't have any, we have one demo <laughs> plane right now because, um, you know, what, one of the things that people, that, that I'll admit it kind of irritates me and we don't get it much anymore is I would never fly an airplane built by high school students. Like, well, I've done first flight, I think on 12 or 13 of them now. Um, John's done first flight on, I'm not sure how many, a bunch. Um, it, you know, first flight is always somewhat stressful, but I've never been even slightly concerned about the fact it's built by high school students. Um, we're at the point now where I generally have a six to nine month waiting list to buy one of our airplanes because we have an extremely good reputation that they're well-built airplanes. And frankly, I think they're built to a higher standard than most of your experimental airplanes. Uh, right. So that's the good news. We, we've got a couple more that are gonna be done here in the next few months that will fix the uh, demo plane short-term issue. Um, but, and I'm actually building an RV-14, which is a similar but faster airplane for my personal use that uh, I'll use to travel with Tango Flight some as well, because we'll paint it Tango Flight livery and it'll, it'll look close enough. Yeah, well, I would think Emily could speak to the building of an airplane and how meticulous <laughs> the program is and things like that. It really, really is. Every rivet, every, um, every nut and bolt you put on there is meticulously looked over by both the mentors and the FAA. Um, it was a grueling process, but it was really, it was fun. It was so fun getting to learn how to do all that stuff. And I can just take that with me wherever I go. I can apply it to my job even here. Yeah. And, and along those lines, uh, Dan, I would imagine that you guys, the inspection process of the work as, as they go along with the build. And then when the project is completed has to be pretty, pretty significant, uh, yeah. from the safety standpoint. Yeah, there, there's what's required by the FAA, um, right. which obviously we do, but then we put in a lot of steps and processes beyond that. We have it set up so that we're very fortunate that we have A&Ps running programs in a number of locations, but frankly, the majority of our schools are just class, I shouldn't say just, they're classroom teachers that don't necessarily have any specific aviation experience. And between the mentors and some of the remote things we do, and then we're also very fortunate that we have a recently retired, I guess I can say that now, Airbus employee that is a DAR. The, he is the representative of the FAA that can inspect these planes that comes out and does all the inspections for us. And while I think he'd call me a friend, he does not let me get any away with anything on these <laughs> planes, nor should he. So, I mean, he does a very thorough job and makes sure we're building safe airplanes. Yeah, that's, that's really great to hear. Dan, you know, a lot of um, educators uh, and, and people that related to that aspect of, of our industry uh, watch this show. So I'm sure it's piqued their interest about what you do. What are some of the things that they should know about right off the top? I, I mean, we've already talked about uh, uh, quite a bit about it, but anything in particular they should know about? Um, and also, we can mention it now and at the end of the show, What's the best way for them to move forward with uh, with wanting to get involved with Tangle Flight? So, so to give you my my very abbreviated sales pitch, um, the Go things that we do that I you know believe <laughs> make us unique. Um, like I said, we're not a build program. We exclusively operate inside high schools um, as a high school credit class. Um, we always own the kits and the airplane. Most school districts just are not capable of owning an airplane for lots of liability reasons, so they don't have to. We always do. We do not need a specific skill set for the teacher. I literally have everything from an aerospace engineer in prior to an auto, tech, auto mechanic that are running programs and being successful. We will teach them what they need as long as they're excited about doing it 
we can teach them what they need to be successful with this. And um, it, it's, you know, it's a life changing, game changing program, but it all operates within terms that school districts are used to dealing with. Yeah. David, how has this program been so helpful to you and, and what kind of results have you seen um, from some of the students that, that you've personally seen come through the program? So, yeah, it's uh, it's been really cool to watch the growth of the students uh, from the time they step into the program to where they were last year. This is our first, last year was our first year. We're in our year two and we start Monday with them back. Um, you know, when I, I would go out there and check, cause I'm not out there every day, but I would go out there and check and first couple of weeks, you know, they're doing inventory and the inventory piece is not the most fun part of the Tango flight. No, not really. No, no, I don't think so. So <laughs> they had to do all that. And it, maybe Emily can speak on that too. So, but they, they're doing, and there was a lot of goofing off and, you know, <laughs> kids, kids were being kids. And, but I'll tell you what, after the transformation of these students, after about a month or two, they come in and they're going to work and they're excited. And the, it's just cool that we have, we have one gentleman that's a former, um, he's a former um, shop teacher at our school. He's 80 years old and he's out there working with these kids and just seeing that connection with the community and older people that they may not get to deal with is really, is really neat. And they're excited. Um, yeah. And, and, and we had some, we had some guys that are like, you know, and, I, and Dan can speak to this too. I was like, how are we going to get mentors? He goes, Oh, you'll get them. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I'm like, no, we won't. I said, we're in prior. We don't really have a big aviation area thing and going on in prior. He goes, Oh, they'll come out of the woodwork. And sure enough, we have a gentleman that's already built his own air cam and he, he flew the Lewis and Clark trail and took pictures from the air. I mean, and, and created a, and wrote a book about it. So they just come out of the woodwork. These mentors are great. And I'll tell you something else that I really think is really neat about the program is the build lanes. Uh, the build lanes are really neat because you don't have one, two or three students doing everything and, and the rest of them watching. They all get out there, they have a plan, they go to work and they get after it. And so that's been neat. And another thing with us at Mid -Amer the Mid-America Industrial Park, it's more of a manufacturing community, but these right. are transferable skills that these kids could go get a job even if it's not something they want to continue on. So, you know, reading a blueprint, measuring, uh, using hand tools, you, all these things that you wouldn't think they would need are transferable skills around us. So that's one piece that we saw that would be really good. Yeah, yeah. I went in, sorry, <laughs> I went in there. I had never picked up a tool in my life. Never, never changed a tire, anything. And I came out of there knowing how to do fiberglass and, you know, different, all these different types of rivets and changing a tire, rigging flight controls. They teach you all of that in that program. And to add on to what, kind of what Dan was saying about, it's not just a build program. We, in the classroom, we built ro rockets, like model rockets. And we recorded the data as we shot them off and, uh, I think the class before me got to do weather balloons um, and there's a little program. We got to build gliders, make them out of balsa wood, um, even like experience um, a little bit about what it's like to be an aircraft controller. They had a little computer program. You could maneuver the little airplanes around and I don't know, it was just super fun. So what all of you are saying is, is that the level of experience that a high schooler can get in a program like Tango Flight can open up all kinds of opportunities for them. It is insane. Yes. <laughs> I'll say, can, I'll say this in terms too. Of, uh, of a young person. It's insane. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to do everything like, Oh my goodness. It's, it is insane. <laughs> no, that that's very cool. You know, I, I was what I was about to say, but I'm, I'm really glad you chimed in, Emily. And I, I was to David, I was coming back to you just in regard to, so you, you were a coach for 24 years, basketball coach. There's a lot of team effort involved in that in, from, from a coaching standpoint and then the team itself working with each other to be a good team and be able to win. How much of that translates to what you see in a program like Tangle Flight? Oh, I think it, I really think it's huge. We, the collaboration aspect and even the, you know, not so much critical thinking in basketball, but even the critical thinking piece that goes on with her. You know, we have one student last year who's graduated 
but he was really good at, he knew the inventory piece. You just told him where to, what you needed and he knew how to find it. I mean, and it was, and so they would, he would be used a lot of times just to go get parts. I mean, because he was really good at finding, it was amazing. This kid, they call him Sherlock because he was so good at finding parts. (laughs) So uh, he got a nickname. I like that. (laughs) um, and, And, you know, and some kids are, some students are working on, and the thing I like too is, even with the, and I, I have to go back to the build lanes, and I know this is kind of off the question, but there's even stuff that, like, if something, you're waiting on a part or something, they have other things you can do, which doesn't, it just keeps the kids always working. There's not a lot of downtime. So, in that aspect, they're always working together, they're doing things, and these kids have kind of become a, you know, a family out there, even with the adult mentors. So, for that part, man, it's, I love it. I think it's the coolest thing in the world to me and I'm not an aviation geek don't get me wrong I it's not my thing but just I love it I think it's so cool no offense taken um (laughs) (laughs) Dan uh tell us a little bit about any some of your experiences that because you've been doing this program I think it's what seven years now um so we've been doing it for seven years a lot of high schools that are now participating and everything so you've seen a lot any experiences in particular stand out like like David was describing in terms of the kids and and uh, the response to the program, et cetera? Oh, gosh, I could spend hours telling stories. Um, we got 10 minutes. OK, well, one, one in particular <laughs> that um, that um, kind of got me a couple years ago, Jim Tidball, um, who's our inspector, he flew one of our planes down from Wichita to Mobile. Um, and I met him there with another one of our planes. And over two days, we flew, I don't know, 25, 30 kids, um, mostly out, out of a couple high schools, but mostly out of um, uh, um, Carver, or I'm sorry, BC Rain in Mobile there. And very poor school district. Um, you know, not, it, it's, it's one of our, our more challenging schools we've had. Um, of those kids, I think two had ever been on an airplane before. And probably a third of them didn't know there was an ocean there. And I mean, the ocean is literally over the bay six seconds after you take off. Um, This one young lady, little small petite thing, I go to get her in the plane. I can tell she's nervous. And so I'm just kind of rattling on while I'm doing my thing. I'm taxiing out. It's a towered airport. And you take off and then you make a right turn and the high school is right there. So I'd always point the high school out there, the kids is, you know, when we took off and I made my right turn. And I said, t- so I say, if you look to your right and see your high school, you see it now. Okay. So I bank a little more. You see it now. No. Okay. So I bank some more. You see it now. <laughs> She's like this, all clenched up, eyes closed. I'm like, honey, you're going to have to open your eyes. No. Like, okay. <laughs> She's not panicking or anything, but she's obviously terrified. So I keep talking and chatting and kind of keeping an eye on her. We finish flying her pattern. I come in and land. She finally opens her eyes. Still, you know, still obviously scared to death. Get off the runway, you know, where I can actually make sure she's okay. I said, you okay? She goes, yeah. She goes, said, why'd you do that? You know, you didn't have to do that. She goes, oh, I wasn't giving up my airplane ride. <laughs> it just kind of made me think, this kid truly was scared out of her mind, probably really thought she was going to die doing this, but she earned that ride and she was going on her airplane ride. Oh so that was just kind of stuck me as, you know, for, for us to go fly around the pattern, it's fun, but it's not, you know, we do it a lot for someone like that. That's, you know, life changing event. experience, a life changing event, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, John, you are with a really big company, Airbus, you know, and Airbus Americas. And, and so, and, and you guys are a very innovative company. You're doing a whole lot of different things uh, innovatively in, in the industry. Um, but at the same time, you are really, you and the programs that you're involved in are really inspiring the next generation. Can you can you speak on that a little bit? Yeah, a, a little bit, uh, but I'm going to change it on a little bit, Vince. And this is going to sound kind of a cliche-ish, but I, I think the part we've touched on mentors and what I've found um, with our mentors and what I found myself personally is you really get back a whole lot. Um, just interacting with the kids and getting the experience with the kids. And, and yeah, they're teenagers. They do some of the dumbest things I've ever seen. And they also do some of the most brilliant things I've ever seen. You know, I've learned from them just different techniques watching them. They're, they're really good. The other part is we bring in young engineers out of uh, straight out of school, out of college. 
And within the engineering curriculum, when you look at structure, it's kind of theoretical and structure just goes together. You never think about, well, how did it get attached? It's just, there's a joint. So when you get some of the young engineers in there and they start to do what Emily touched on, they go, okay, well, you got to put a rivet in here somehow. You got to put a bolt <laughs> in there. How, how does it connect? What does that mean? And how does it, how does the, the load transfer? So there's a combination of both the mentors learning um, and getting engaged with the students and, and really getting positive energy, kind of getting that feedback from, from them, as well as just getting hands on. Yeah. Even if you, you grew up and you went through an engineering program, just getting hands on and understanding what, it, what edge distance means and, and yeah. patterns of holes and, and what do you do if you make a mistake? Okay, mm -hmm. now you, how big of a mistake? How are you going to fix it? All that kind of thing. It's just, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a program that goes in both directions, not just with the students, but with those that are engaged in the program as well. So Couldn't it fits in really well. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more about that. There is a, a great satisfaction out of what what you see from the kids as they grow and, and what you get from them. Uh, and, and yes, I've raised three. I know the dumb versus brilliant thing. Uh, but <laughs> um, but no, that's that that's a really good point. I'm, I'm glad that you brought that up. Emily, I keep somebody wants to oh, I was gonna, go ahead. I was going to say. One of the things that I, I think that <clears throat> makes us somewhat unique and that's been a lot of fun to watch is we're not just a program for, you know, what I always call the BC Cal kids, you know, your top 10%. We get a lot of those kids, they do really well with the program, but we oh, get yeah. a lot of the kids that are more interested in the hands-on, more direct to the workforce stuff. And a lot of times in a high school setting, those kids self-segregate. They go in different directions. They don't interact with each other that much. And I frankly was kind of proud of this. And I was uh, in a meeting with John a couple of years ago and kind of touting this. And he looks at me and goes, you mean like the real world? And it's like, <laughs> well, yeah, I killed, you know, took my thunder. But but he's right. Yeah, you got to know how the engineers have to interact with the mechanics, have to interact with the pilots. And we don't do a real good job of that in education of bringing it all together sometimes. So I think this helps with this. Now, most of my students, when I make a smart act, Smart Alec comment and say, get your A and P in your private. They don't look like Emily did, but uh, well, Emily is definitely an exception to the rule on that. I took it literally. You know, and you you bring up something that I, that's dear to my heart. I think it's it's very important. Unfortunately, or fortunately, but a lot of kids aren't necessarily bound for college and to get an engineering or you know a, a degree of some sort. But they have the talent and the skills to do something, you know, in, on a two year program or whatever the case may be. But they are often ignored. And in fact, they often feel uncomfortable because schools a lot of times tend to emphasize, yeah, you go to high school. The next thing you do is you go to college. And, you know, everybody in that school is not necessarily, you know, destined to do that. Um, and so. Having uh, programs like Tangle Flight that can offer, you know, an alternative. And, and, you know, I was coming back to you, Emily, because I think, mm -hmm. and I was going to actually ask you a couple of specific questions, because I think what you are doing is a great example. And I mentioned this to you earlier, it was a, is a great example because you are, you, you have your AMP now, you know, mm -hmm. you have your private and your instrument. So you're, you're doing the Dan uh, preferred track or recommended track. Um, <laughs> yeah. So now you're getting ready to go to school and study environmental science with a minor in biology, and you're looking yeah. at working at some at a place like NOAA or NASA or both, as I like to say. I'm like, Dan, because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm like Dan. Why can't you do both? <laughs> you know? So they kind of complement each other in certain ways, anyhow. So, uh -huh. um, but tell us about what about that path that you're you're on right now and and about you deciding that you know when did you decide that okay you told us about first becoming an amp and then mm -hmm. told us how you were inspired to go ahead and start pursuing being a pilot and now you're pursuing going back to school and you know pursuing environmental science so where does that all yeah. come from? so i think all, all i was growing up uh, I loved science, all aspects of it. And 
aerospace engineering was just another aspect I could add on top of that scientific brain that I had. Um, and honestly, senior year came around and I had no idea what I was going to do. I had no idea. So I just kept working at the airport. And the more I worked at the airport, the more ratings I got. Um, <laughs> and um, I wish I could say there was a deciding a, a certain point where I decided that I wanted to go to college. Um, but it was just really a multitude of small kind decisions. Of forward. <laughs> yeah, it just kind of rolled itself um, into place where, I, okay, I want my private pilot. Well, why don't you get your IFR? Well, I'll go get my IFR. Why don't know? Well, now I can go get my ANP. Well, now there's so many opportunities. And I wanted to explore all of them, both on the practical side um, and on the knowledge side. And uh, I don't know that I want my degree necessarily to be in aviation. A lot of people do, and that's okay. Um, but like I said, I like to explore. So I wanted to explore kind of an environmental science that incorporates uh, atmospheric stuff, geology, marine biology, all that um, cool stuff. It's all rolled into one degree. Um, and the reason I'm getting a degree is because you know, if I wanted to go to Air Force and fly in the Air Force and be an officer, I could go do that. Um, it opens up um, a lot more doors um, for what I want to do. Not everybody wants to do that, but. Yeah. So about your major, I have met pilots, young pilots like yourself, <laughs> that, that have degrees in, uh, I met one in art history, um, uh -huh. in um, English literature. Yeah. And, and these are Pardon the expression. I hope I don't get bleeped on it. Badass oh, pilots, but they're you know they um they had so so the major uh, your point is well taken with that, and it's really great for people to hear that because mm -hmm. you can, there's so much you can do, and I love the fact that you say there's so much you can do in the industry, but you're mm -hmm. also kind of thinking ahead in terms of saying okay, this is something I'm interested in, and encompasses a lot of different things. Um, it is not an aviation degree, but it is a a degree applicable to what I'm, what you're trying to do moving forward. So I, I think yeah. that's, that's really great. As we kind of wrap things up and I'll start with you, Emily, with all of the things that you've experienced first at high school, Tango flight and, and the things you've done, private instrument and, and uh, aircraft and power plant, what, what would you say to your peers, um, whether they're currently in high school or college or whatever, and they're pursuing something in aviation, what kind of advice would you give them? Um, well, it doesn't have to be a dream. You know, you're always sitting there dreaming about what if I did this? What if I did that? Well, maybe, maybe I'll do it in the future, but you can go walk into your local airport right now and ask people, just start asking. And those questions will give you good answers and people will help you. Um, get to where you want to be, wherever that is, whether you want to be an air aircraft controller, a mechanic, whatever you want to do, people will help you out. Just got to go look for it. I couldn't say it better myself. David, <laughs> you've been a longtime educator, coach. Um, you're a big fan of the Tangle Flight program. How about you? What kind of advice would you give to young people that might be watching and interested in, in this um, and, and doing something like this? Find something you're passionate about. That's to me, that's it. That makes life easy. Um, you know, I, I, I changed my major five times. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but once I found out what I wanted to do, I started working at Eddie Sutton's basketball camps and I knew I wanted to, man, I had good grades and got through it. As soon as I knew what I wanted to do, it was life was easy. And I think that's it. You know, obviously Emily's passionate about what she's doing, I think you got to find something you're passionate about, something that interests you. But and it's so hard for kids these days to do that. Sometimes they don't know what they want to do. They got eight. Everybody's telling them what they should be doing. But, mm -hmm. you know, they got to find what they're passionate about. Couldn't agree with that more. John, you're a Naval Academy graduate, United States Marine Corps. You know, you did the Navy Reserve. You've done engineering, you know, all of your professional life in some capacity or another. Um, and. So you've seen a little bit of everything. You've taken a personal interest in things like the Tangle Flight Program. How about you? What 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 advice do you have to put out there? You know, um, I think 
we we tend in aviation sometimes to allow ourselves to get too specialized. Now, yeah, I've 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 taken a different path. We've all taken different paths to come into the industry, but sometimes once we get in the industry, we we start to get too specialized. And the and the nice thing about the Tango Flight operation, and really, it's just about building an airplane. It gets right back down to the brass tacks of saying we got into this because we like airplanes and we like aviation, we like flying. So you kind of just say let's let's put aside all that specialization and let's just go figure out how to build an airplane, whether it's the students figuring it out or the mentors or just getting engaged. And that that I think is the uh, the key message here for me. The advice is to remember it's about airplanes. So the idea is just let's get hands on and go build an airplane and bring along some uh, some young folks with us and put them in the airplane, take them flying. We really only touched a little bit on some of those experiences when you first strap them in an airplane and you tell them, OK, you built this airplane. Now we're going to go fly it. I mean, that's a that's a powerful moment. It's and, uh, huge. Yeah. Once, it, it, once the wheels lift the ground, all of a sudden, even if they have flown in an airplane, it was probably an Airbus weighing about 150,000 pounds. Now they're in an airplane that weighs about you know a thousand pounds, and uh, and you just experience aviation in a different way. It's just it's really just about get back to aviation, get back to airplanes, get back to being in the sky. Yeah, and to, as I like to say, take us home, Dan. So Dan, you 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 created Tango Flight. It's it's grown exponentially since you started it. Um, your path was like everybody else. Your path was not exactly what you initially had imagined. Um, and, and then you got inspired to do this program that's now inspiring you to grow it um, and see it do more and more and, and, and things like that. So give us your take. Um, well, I'm, I'm jealous. Yeah, that when, when we were Emily's age, you couldn't buy a job in the aviation industry. Uh, especially as pilots. Yeah, the, the coming pilot shortage has been a running joke since uh, as long as I can remember. Uh, but in the last few years, it's it's become real when it's not just the pilots, it's everything aviation related. Um, I try to convince Emily to let me take her around Oshkosh just to see how many job offers <laughs> we can get for fun. Um, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, it, it's it's tough for the industry, but for these kids, the opportunities are just amazing. I mean, they they really can go any of a dozen different directions, and there's no bad choice in the bunch. I agree with that. I the, the opportunity this is the time, uh, and it's going to be the time for you know in the next few decades to come. It's just it's just Absolutely. wide open. Um, and as as you guys have all said, it doesn't matter what aspect of the industry you know everything applies. You know, I always like to tell people that if you're into like interior design, well, somebody has to design the cabin of an aircraft, you know, and know about material and blah, 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 et cetera. And then I could go on and on and on. So yep. point taken. Listen, it's been, we're out of time, but it has really been great uh, talking with all of you and hearing all of your perspectives. Emily, you're a star. So you're a star <laughs> of our show today. <laughs> With, with your accomplishments and you're just getting started. That's, that's, it's almost yeah. scary, but it's, it's, it's like, <laughs> wow, you know, she's just revving up her motors. She's, she's still at, at idle, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, no, that's really great. But, but I want to thank all of you, uh, John, thank you. Uh, excuse me, Dan, thank you for, you know, helping to put this together and, and really putting a spotlight on Tango Flight. Um, but all of you, David's great to meet you. John, it's always great to see you. And I uh, just appreciate everything that you guys have done. Thanks, Thank Vince. You. Have a great weekend. Absolutely. So, well, this has been another edition of All Things Aviation and Aerospace, which is a video webcast and audio podcast presentation of the uh, from the Private Air Media Group. It is available to watch on demand via my private air media youtube channel facebook live page and i can't believe this oh there we go everything wants to pop on my, on my screen at the same time all of a sudden <laughs> facebook live page and, and linkedin live page which by the way all of this has been streaming live and now it's going to be available afterwards uh the audio only version is also available on spotify apple or wherever you choose to listen to your podcast have some great shows coming up um, as we turn on final approach to the fall season, including 
the latest opportunities in advanced air mobility uh, and uh, a couple of the airline pilot training programs, et cetera. But until then, please take care, stay safe, safe flying if you're a pilot like me and blue skies.